Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-empowerment. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you and your company stay relevant in an era of rapid change and 10x your results in both your professional and personal life. Each week, I'll bring you corporate innovators, entrepreneurs, authors, keynote speakers, and thought leaders such as Steve Blank, David Allen, Brad Feld, Tim Harford, Karen Dillon, Jenny Blake, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, Pascal Finette, Ryan Blair, and Ash Moria, to name just a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some quick digestible insights to help you end your week on a high as you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation hub school and consultancy based in Melbourne, Australia and Singapore that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methods and tools to navigate change and survive and thrive in an era of rapid disruption. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit www.collectivecamp.com. US. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared. Today I bring you Seth Stevens Davidovich. He's a New York Times op-ed contributor, a visiting lecturer at the Warden School, and a former Google data scientist. His research, which uses new big data sources to uncover hidden behaviors and attitudes, has appeared in the Journal of Public Economics and other prestigious publications, and has just surfaced in his new book, Everybody Lies, New Data and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are, which explores what the vast amounts of information now instantly available to us reveals about ourselves and our world. Expect to learn a number of things in this episode of Future Squared, including what can we do to not confuse correlation with causation? What kinds of things we usually tell Google that we wouldn't tell our loved ones? Whether the type of school you go to determines your success in life? How AI and machine learning can behave in a way that may be construed as racist? And how Google searches can be used to predict the outcome of elections? How companies can use data to build better products? And are we collecting too much data? So with that, I bring you the one and only Seth Stevens Davidovich. Welcome to the show, Seth. Thanks for having me, Steve. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program, and you're joining us all the way from uh, Brooklyn, New York. That's correct. Would that make you a, a Brooklyn Nets fan or not so much of a sports fan? I'm still a Knicks fan, but uh, that guy, Greg, grew up in New Jersey. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm close to giving up on the Knicks. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, I've been a NBA fan going back to the early 90s. I still remember the days of uh, John Starks and Patrick Ewing, but even back then, they, they struggled to uh, pull it together to win a title. Yeah, but I mean, at least they were making the playoffs and stuff. Now they're just a mess. And I basically study how we can learn about what we can learn about human behavior from internet data. So historically, the way to understand the human psyche is with surveys. Mm -hmm. But the problem with surveys is people lie to surveys. Uh, so, but we can learn a lot more by watching what people do on the internet. Excellent. And, and this is essentially the premise of your first book, um, which was released last month. So congratulations. Um, the book is entitled Everybody Lies, New Data and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are, which explores vast amounts of information that is instantly available to us now and what it reveals to us about ourselves and our world, provided, of course, as you say, we ask the right questions. So um, I guess this aligns perfectly with uh, what you've just told us about how you spend your time. Within your book, you used Google searches to measure um, things like racism, self-induced abortion, depression, child abuse, hateful mobs, the science of humor, sexual preference, anxiety, and the list goes on and on. And um, in today's age, it seems we're much more comfortable telling Google about things we normally wouldn't tell anyone else, and maybe not even the people closest to us. And your book argues that this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Well, it's not a bad thing if you're a researcher, because mm -hmm. we actually have for the first time... Uh, data on some of these topics that we wouldn't otherwise know anything about. Uh, so a lot of places that where the data hasn't existed, now the data exists. Yeah. Whether it's a good thing from a society's perspective, that's more debatable. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But definitely from a, from a researcher's perspective, it can help to uncover lots of insights that um, have various applications, which we'll touch on in today's conversation. Um, just on the um, amount of data that you mind, I mean, how many Google searches are we talking? Uh, a lot. I mean, some of, these, some of these searches, we're talking about millions, uh, hundreds of millions of searches. Uh, the, the data set's enormous because it's everybody. Google searches. Yeah. And that's a 
advantage relative to other data sources, uh, which are only a survey may only have a thousand, couple thousand people. Mm. I mean, you came to a number of fascinating conclusions. And um, I mean, as a child of the 1980s, I saw a lot of my favorite bands get taken to court by the PMRC for, you know, supposedly encouraging suicide and violent behavior. And your research actually looked at the link between violent films and the crime rate. Um, Keen to explore what you uncovered in that space. Well, this is actually, uh, this I was describing some other people's research, but they were, they looked at what happens when a violent movie comes to town and the idea would be does violent crime go up or does it stay the same when mm-hmm. you show a really gruesome uh, terrible movie in a city yeah and they found that on the weekend when a violent movie comes to town violent crime doesn't rise it doesn't even stay the same it plummets oh. and the reason is basically violent movies attract young men with high testosterone and it basically takes them away from pool halls or clubs or bars or places where they get in a lot of trouble mm. and has them sit sober and peacefully in a movie theater. Mm. And um, I mean, did you explore what happens, say, in the weeks after a movie comes to town and those uh, violent types have um, been somewhat inspired or maybe not so inspired by the film? Yeah, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't see the effects all the way many weeks out, but mm. it, it at least says in the short term that they, they, uh, uh, they actually reduce crime when laboratory experiments have suggested that they might increase crime in the short term. A conversation I had on the podcast recently touched on um, MBA programs and whether the network one develops that a program is enough to justify the high price tag and taking two years out of your life and career and you know the opportunity cost that comes with that. And um, your book also looked at the uh, link between the school you go to and the uh, eventual success you'll achieve in your professional life. So um, again, did this um, was this myth uh, busted or was it was it proven? Yeah, there's a, a busted basically. So there's there's a huge correlation between where you go to school and how you end up doing in life. So if you go to Harvard or Stanford, you're much more likely to earn more money, to become famous, to have a prestigious job Mm -hmm. than if you go to a lesser school. But the entire reason for this is because more talented people are accepted to these schools. So it has nothing to do with the actual schools. It's all because the people who go, who go there are more talented to begin with. Yeah, and, and that was going to be one of my questions because, you know, if you look at the data and there's a strong correlation between school and success, you'd say, oh, well, it's because of the school they went to, but that's not necessarily it. Otherwise, you're just confusing correlation with causation. And with um, data analytics, big data becoming such a big topic in um, the corporate world, companies using it to try and uh, gather customer insights and therefore support their product development – I mean, how can they try and avoid the the, um, pitfalls of, say, confusing correlation with causation and then going off and spending tons of money building something that nobody wants? Well, you just have to be careful. Uh, It's I I talk about in the book. It's not I think people just throw around the term correlation doesn't mean causation and they just Mm -hmm. assume like, okay, then all data is meaningless. Sometimes it doesn't even matter. Causation doesn't even matter. Say you're just trying to predict what people will do in the future. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really matter. You can, If you find that something correlates, it has predictive power, it doesn't necessarily matter the reason for it, but it can still predict stuff in the future. So uh, you, you just have to really be careful in what question you're trying to ask. Are you even looking for a causal question? Sometimes you're just looking to predict something in the future, and it doesn't matter if, uh, if, if the correlation is causal. Yeah. I wanted to explore a slightly more um, risque topic, and that is our sex life. And I know that you now consider yourself a, shall we say, a sexpert of sorts, um, having done all of this research. And um, you've said that many faces of the human psyche don't necessarily reveal themselves on a day-to-day basis. However, they tend to show up at 2 a.m. on Pornhub. So I think, uh, I mean, that there, there are really a lot of interesting things that go against conventional wisdom. So mm-hmm. one of them I talk about is the popularity of porn featuring violence against women. Mm-hmm. And uh, not only is this porn very popular, which may not be so surprising, mm-hmm. but somewhat surprisingly, the porn is much more popular among women than men. Right. Uh, I think people's uh, porn preferences aren't always politically correct. Yeah, and that aligns quite closely with what you uncovered around racism as well, where common misconception is that it's the American South where you find racism, but your yeah. research uncovered something quite different. Exactly. So uh, many parts of the North have higher races, have higher racism. I, I measured racism with racist searches that people make on Google, which are predominantly for jokes mocking African-Americans. Mm. And these are definitely not just concentrated in the South. Uh, they're they're in, in the North as well. Are you able to use those searches then to determine what the outcome of, a, say, an election would be if, say, one of the candidates was African-American? Well, yeah, you definitely see that in those 
uh, places with higher racist searches, they oppose African-American candidates. In particular, they did not support Barack Obama relative to other Democratic candidates when he was running for president. Mm -hmm. And they, these places also uh, were big fans of Donald Trump. In fact, racist right. searches on Google is the single highest predictor of Trump's support in the Republican primary. Yeah, that's fascinating stuff. And um, on, on the topic of people's belief systems, um, I wanted to uh, – dig deeper a little bit around that. And, you know, we've all got entrenched belief systems that date back to, say, infancy and biases that influence the decisions we make, how we show up in the world, and ultimately our experience of life. Can your research um, help us to unlock these biases to effectively help us make better decisions at a personal level? I think we can. I think uh, it also helps corporations uh, over overcome these biases. I talk about how Netflix initially uh, – Netflix used to ask people, ask their users what videos they'd want to watch a few days down the road, what movies they want to watch a few days down the road. Mm -hmm. And if you ask people, everyone thinks in a few days they're going to want to watch something really intellectual, some documentary about 14th century France. Mm -hmm. and when this day actually comes around, they don't want to watch that. They want to watch the, the same lowbrow stuff they've always watched. And Netflix realized that they could do a better job building their own algorithms to suggest movies rather than asking people to suggest, to asking people what movies they want suggested for them in the future. Mm. So I think uh, people are consistently overconfident about what they're going to do in the future. They th think they're going to exercise more than they will. They think they're going to eat better than they uh, will. They think they're going to watch more intellectual stuff than they uh, will. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, you, you, yeah, you data in some sense can be better at predicting uh, these things because data isn't overly optimistic. It's just – it's all about the numbers. And uh, on, on Netflix suggesting particular content that people would like to watch, what, what are your views on companies using algorithms to suggest content and then effectively having people's experience of, of life being somewhat limited or their worldview rather being limited because you're constantly watching the same stuff you've always watched? And I guess you know, there's a lot of talk. Um, or at least there was a lot of talk uh, during the election around people's uh, online echo chambers and only being dished up stuff that they tend to uh, agree with. Um, yeah, do you have any views on how companies can help or whether there's any sort of ethical questions in this space that companies need to be conscious of? I think there are. I think the 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 fact the idea that we're in an echo chamber on the internet is not true. Um, it mm -hmm. is true that people on the internet tend to be around people like themselves, but that's true offline as well. Yeah, that's it's true. true. The clubs we join, the dinner parties we attend, uh, the places we work, it's not any worse. In fact, it's a little better online. So, 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 that, so that is, uh, I think that's an overrated concern, but there definitely are ethical concerns uh, from the internet and, and, and a world. I think one issue is algorithms. A lot of, a lot of decisions are going to be made more and more using just machine learning. Mm -hmm. And machine learning can be racist, for example. It may pick up correlations that are just proxying for race. But because it's all done by computers, people won't even realize that it's being racist. Right. Uh, so that there are definitely uh, huge concerns uh, in this new era of machine learning and AI and big data. So, I mean, for our audience who may not be say, that uh, advanced when it comes to the world of machine learning and AI. Um, perhaps can you elaborate just a little bit more on what you mean when you say uh, machine learning uh, can be racist? Because that's a fascinating point. So, for example, there was a, somebody did a study. They found out if you put in to Google an African-American name, mm -hmm. So a, African, a name that's likely to be African-American would be something like Latasha Washington. Right. A name that's more likely to be white is something like uh, Megan Smith. Mm -hmm. If you put in an African-American name, you're much like more likely to get an ad for a be criminal background check. Right. Now, the people who did that, no human being decides what names get those ads. That's all done by algorithms where they're basically putting in formulas and, and crunching numbers and predicting – based on uh, millions of clicks, what people are likely to want to see. Mm. But because on average, uh, African Americans maybe are more likely to have a criminal background or because people are subconsciously racist and more concerned about a potential criminal background of an African American, the machine learning picks a uh, delivers this bias and this punishes African Americans who are who have never had been close to any criminal situation that now when an employer looks them up the first thing they see is this criminal background check and it may just scare them away or a potential date looks them up they see that and it scares them away our 
audience predominantly is made up of corporate executives with an interest in innovation. We've got early stage entrepreneurs working on new ideas. And obviously, where products go wrong, where companies go wrong, is they oftentimes build stuff that nobody wants to buy. I mean, you mentioned surveys right up at the start of the show. And you know, companies run focus groups and surveys, and usually people are paid to um, complete these surveys. So you question the quality of people completing them. Um, like you said, they might lie on these surveys. Um, they might say that, yes, I'd pay for this product, but no money is actually changing hands. So is that a good test? So um, using um, people's Google searches and other forms of data to get deep into that customer behavior can help us um, to develop products based on intent rather than based on um, assumption. Definitely. I think any entrepreneur would be smart to analyze Google searches to see how big the, a potential market is and where the market is located. A hundred percent. I think even if you think of the biggest company of the past 20 years, Facebook, I, mm -hmm. I would argue that Facebook, there, there were clues in Google searches that something like Facebook would be a, a big success. Because I think one of the searches that people were, were making in those early days before Facebook existed were for searches of their friends. Uh, so you could have maybe, like Google should have just looked, where, what searches are people making in huge numbers where the material we're offering right now is not very good. Mm -hmm. And I think they would have found that it was uh, searches for people's friends, that people were searching for their friends and not finding anything of interest. So Facebook kind of filled that, that, uh, that void. Yeah. And it's definitely something um, I advise a lot of our startups in the space here to um, to do. And you know, we oftentimes run workshops, and someone's got this idea that they're super excited about. And I'll say, hey, check out their Google Keyword Planner tool and um, see how many people are searching for it. And they'll do that, and they'll find that it's usually you know, less than 100 around the world um, per month, um, which doesn't speak volumes about the market. But then there's the um, yeah, but, but sometimes sometimes uh, people don't know that they want something until you show it to them. So I wouldn't, so I wouldn't say you, you should totally uh, get rid of, you know, I don't think if Airbnb, I don't think there were Google searches before Airbnb existed saying, uh, you know, can I rent an apartment from a stranger in a city? Uh, because people didn't know that they, that they wanted that until it existed. Yeah, exactly. And I was going to say the flip side of that is when you're creating a new market and the market doesn't exist, so the searches won't be there. And, you know, that's what um, a lot of large companies trip up on when they ask their employees to complete business cases and whenever they've got a new idea. And one of the criteria in those business cases is how big is the market? And, well, if that's what you're basing every investment decision on, uh, you're going to miss out on those new disruptive ideas like your Airbnbs, um, which people simply aren't searching for. Yeah, yeah, definitely, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I was just going to touch on, uh, dig a bit deeper onto that topic, which was around um, A-B testing and what you've seen companies do in this space when it comes to um, product development. Yeah, A-B testing is hugely powerful. Uh, I, I, I mean, it just it's kind of obvious that companies should be doing it, that every big company should be doing it should uh, to dramatically improve their products. There are, although, to be honest, a lot of companies, I think, are not doing a great job of A-B testing. Mm. Why do you say that? Well, they make a lot of mistakes. For example, they tend to test something in a given time, in a short time period, and then it wins, but it may not win in a different time period. So it may just mm. be that it won because in that particular hour, you know, or that particular week, that there was something unique about that particular hour, that particular week, and then they don't test the thing again to make sure that it really, uh, the effects still less. Yeah. So uh, I'm not, I, I think A-B testing in theory is incredibly powerful, but most businesses aren't using it as, as, as well as they could. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And um, a question I'm often asked is when um, early stage startups, say, are running a bunch of tests to – uh, validate or invalidate their assumptions underpinning a business model. Um, they often ask how much data is enough, um, and you know, oftentimes it's obviously going to be different for different um, audiences, different products. Uh, depends on your co cost per acquisition, your customer lifetime value. But I mean, what views do you have on how much data is enough when you know trying to test assumptions for a new idea? I think people exaggerate how much data they need, or people become obsessed with the size of their data set. Mm -hmm. so they just if their data set is big enough, then all the questions will magically be answered, which is not true. Uh, so I think frequently it's about collecting the right data. Make sure that you have the data you need uh, to, to answer the question that you're asking. Yeah. I think that's, that's really much more important than the size of the data set. Yeah, because the risk is you could have a huge data set, but say 95% of the people uh, in that data set aren't really your target audience, and it can actually become a, a false positive or a false negative rather. The thing you're measuring is not exactly what you care about. Maybe you're only measuring clicks, and clicks are not everything you care about. Mm. So, 
Yeah, and I had a, I had a conversation with uh, Sean Ellis uh, from GrowthHackers.com last week, and he said the same thing about how too many companies have this thing called a one metric that matters, and what that kind of comes at the risk of is all the submetrics that still matter. Which, for example, say you're using Airbnb um, and you're just focused on nights booked but that comes at the detriment of, say, nights or second trips. So you've got lots of new visitors, but there's no returning visitors because the the quality um, has basically been overlooked. Exactly. And I came across an interesting um, A-B test recently, which was um, Eric Reese's new book, The Startup Way. The book cover was, um, they came up with heaps of iterations of that, but not only did they test that online with different um, banner ads on Facebook and um, other platforms, but also uh, in bookstores. So they'd print out a bunch of different bookstore sleeves and just put them on a book and just show people pictures and say, okay, show people pictures of the bookshelf and say, okay, pick three books that you remembered. So they'd show them the photo, they'd take it away, they'd say, okay, what three books do you remember? And they'd say, oh, there was that big red one with the yellow writing, which was the title. Um, and again, they just observed whether or not people picked up that book in the bookstore as, as a test. Because, I mean, the first impressions are everything online. That, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's really creative. Um, excellent. I, I want to assume that I A-B tested my book because I wrote so much about A-B testing, but I really didn't. You didn't um, do any A-B testing for your book or... I did not. Maybe I should have. <laughs> maybe. Maybe for the next one. So um, on product creation, Seth, with um, big data and retrospective searches, um, I imagine it can be used to identify patterns and determine whether, say, someone is likely to, you know, we've talked about voting one way with um, the, the racist searches, but whether they're likely to buy a particular product. And I know something you've also looked at, which is that you can determine whether or not someone is at the risk of a particular disease or in uh, conferring with Dr. Google. Well, there's a study of, uh, it, it, of, of search volumes over time. So you can tell once pe- when people get something like pancreatic cancer, they tend to search about it. They say, just diagnose the pancreatic cancer or pancreatic cancer support group. Mm-hmm. So what you can do is you can look at the, ser- the symptoms people searched in the months leading up to a pancreatic cancer diagnosis. And when you do this, you find really clear and subtle patterns in the data. When someone searches for indigestion followed by abdominal pain, that's a risk factor for pancreatic cancer. When they search a indigestion by itself, that's not a risk factor. And that's a really, really subtle pattern in the data that even doctors themselves did not know about, but is only uh, we only see when you analyze uh, these tens of thousands of patients and all this, the time series of their searches. So that sounds like something that people maybe at one stage could be able to opt into, say, some kind of alert where based on your Google search, we see that you may be at risk of X. I think that's right. I think you wouldn't want, some people maybe wouldn't want to know, but I definitely would want to know because something like pancreatic cancer, the earlier you're told, the better your chances of survival are. Yeah, and couldn't agree more. I'd definitely opt into something like that. So um, when it comes to driving culture change in large organizations, um, today with uh, technology moving as fast as it is, companies are often built to respond to that. I mean, a lot of, especially your large traditional organizations, they're very much focused on delivery, not so much discovery. They're focused on you know, planning to the nth degree and not necessarily being adept at taking risk. And like you said, done is better than perfect. Um, when it comes to uncovering the way people actually think. I mean, in in large organizations, people tend to self-censor themselves a lot. It tends to be a lot of politics, but getting to the nitty gritty of how people think in organizations and then using data to determine whether or not we can help to change the culture, um, identify, I say, pools of people that don't align with a particular mindset that we need to develop. Is there any way um, that we can use this data, uh, Seth, to help companies shift their culture to one that, say, moves from uh, just focusing on delivery of an ex- existing business model to one that focuses on discovery? Or it might even be in the space of, say, recruiting people that have the right mindset. Yeah, I think definitely data in general. Just the more data you have, the more you can find what predicts a good employee or a good product. And uh, you know, just basically look for patterns. Find the right data and look for patterns that uh, help you make better decisions. I think every company should be using more and more data to make decisions. One thing I wanted to touch on was it seems as if we're collecting data on almost 
everything these days to the point where drawing meaningful insights from data is getting harder and harder. Um, large companies, for example, have tons of data at their disposal, but few are capable of making any sense of it. And I know with the NSA, they've got 4 billion people under their watchful eyes, and there's some ex-staff members from the NSA coming out and basically saying that the NSA is so overwhelmed with data that it's no longer effective. So, I mean, what's your view on collecting too much data to the point where we can't actually um, extract meaningful insights from it? Well, I, th- I think collecting more data is always better, mm-hmm. but yeah, you have to know how to ask the right question. I think the problem is is that people just assume if you collect all the, da- the data, then your mag- the questions are magically going to be answered for you, and that's not the case. Mm. So you still have to know how to ask the right question and how to limit your data to something that's really the, sex- the subset that's really valuable for the particular question that you ask. Yeah. So I'm definitely all in favor of collecting as much data as possible, but don't think that that uh, gets you off the hook from asking the right question and cutting down your data to, uh, to answer it. Yeah, and and I know one thing that data scientists often say struggle with is that you've got to spend quite a bit of time uh, cleaning the data before you can actually start to um, generate insights. So in terms of um, organizations um, collecting data, is there anything they can do um, up front to make the job of the data scientist down the line a little bit easier, or is that just uh, the nature of the beast when it comes to extracting data that you know, depending on what you're looking for, you may have to clean the data a particular way. Yeah, I think I think there are going to be more automated ways to do that. I've, I've talked to some companies that are working on that, mm-hmm. but right now there's not a great solution except to yeah, it's no fun, no no data scientist. It's not their dream job, but unfortunately, you, you have, it is an important part of data science. <laughs> Excellent. So um, I've come to the end of the formal questions, Seth, but I wanted to um, throw you into our three-question lightning round, which is a little bit of fun. So question number one um, is, if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company lifecycle, and this could be going back to the 18th century if we had to, it could be going back to the early days of um, Apple in a garage with Wozniak and Steve Jobs, who would it be and why? Uh, I think the early days of Google, just because it was such an exciting company organizing all the world's information. All, all the people were really smart and motivated and, and idealistic. Uh, so I think that would, that would definitely be the best. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Plus, I'd be really rich. <laughs> well, there's that little uh, benefit too. Um, second question, Seth, is if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Uh, ask any question. I'd probably want to just interview Elon Musk about exactly what's happening with robots uh, and mm-hmm. – and uh, where he where he sees that going, because uh, I, I I don't really feel like I totally understand. I know that he says that it's becoming really really advanced, and people outside don't really understand how powerful these robots are getting really fast. But I don't feel like I totally understand it, so I'd like to know more about that. Yeah, that's a great answer. I actually uh, read Homo Deus by Noah Yuval Harari recently, and um, he basically said that AI, computers, robotics is going to get so advanced that they're going to be able to envisage a future that, as human beings, we're just not capable of envisaging. So if we think it's confusing That's now, what all these people say, but it's like so hard for me to imagine that I just want to talk to more <laughs> about exactly what that even means. Yeah. It's also like when they say we're living in a simulation – I don't understand what that means. I understand the simulation argument, but like, are we in a video game? Are we in like a computer? I just don't really totally get it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And one, one thing that I don't quite get when they say oh, we're living in a simulation is, well, I mean, if I was simulating some kind of a uh, alternate reality, I mean, surely at some point I'd get tired of that and I'd pull the plug or I'd set up other simulations and, or maybe we're just some part of part of some ongoing data set that people from some other universe or whatever we want to call it are collecting. I don't know, but do you get what I'm saying? Because, hey, if if we're in a simulation, I've been on this earth for 33 years now, surely someone would have pulled the plug on the simulation by now, right? Yeah, yeah. I I don't really get exactly what it means to be in a simulation. Yeah. No, that's that's a good one. That's a good one. And lucky last, Seth. Um, you know, you spend the last couple of years writing your book. Um, you're a visiting lecturer over at uh, the Warden School. You've done all sorts of cool things. You work for Google. Are there any um, rituals or routines that you uh, have to keep you on top of your game? Or uh, no, I think I should have rituals and routines. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a ritual routine person. I just kind of get work done. But I think I'd be much more effect- productive if I actually did. 
uh, have more rituals and routines. Awesome. Well, um, people can pick up a copy of the book Everybody Lies on Amazon. They can find out a bit more about you, Seth, at sethsd.com and they can connect with you on Twitter at seths underscore d. Well, thanks again for uh, giving up some time to speak to the listeners of Future Squared. You've been an awesome guest and given us lots of value bombs and um, I look forward to uh, speaking to you sometime in the future. Thanks so much for having me. Hey guys, it's Steve again. If you're picking up what we're putting down, we'd love it if you took just a minute of your time to like, share, or subscribe to Future Squared on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. It would mean a hell of a lot to the team here who work effortlessly to bring you thought leaders and experts on topics of corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement on a weekly basis. As always, you can find more resources on innovation, um, including blogs, books, podcasts, videos, webinars, and tools at www.collectivecamp.us. If you'd like to connect with me on Twitter, you can do so at Steve Glaveski. That's G-L-A-V-E-S-K-I. Until next time, keep innovating. Future Squared out.